statement pertaining to one value or values in opposition to each other. Can you repeat that please? The last one. It will either be an absolute statement okay. about one value or two values in opposition to each other, which is one of the oldest forms of debate, BT dubs. Values in opposition to each other is a dialectic, <clears throat> right? It's saying we have these two things working on opposite sides of a spectrum, and we're trying to get to the middle in terms of attaining that middle. So an example of that would be the balance between national security and individual privacy, right? In both instances, we're concerned with our rights and our well-being but very different ways of looking at them and how to achieve them. Right? For fact, something that could be considered a fact round right, would be creationism explains how the world came to be. And then there would be contentions on both sides of the argument explaining why that's either true or false. Right? Or for the, from the scientific side, the Big Bang happened. And the Big Bang is why the world is the way it is, or the universe is the way it is. Yeah. And the other side of that, you have people that have spiritual or religious beliefs that don't believe that we just all are made of stardust. Right, that's the, the creationism the, side. From the big, from the, according to that. Um, whoever came up with that idea that we were stardust, we were creating a star of stardust. And, right. Yeah, you know, that would be the creationism side. Yeah. So that. You know, you're right, I, I, that's a good argument, because then actually, if you look at the factual part of it, um, and if you follow the, the Bible, or if, I don't know, the spiritual, but the biblical part where how the creation, that's how uh, God created Adam through, um, through dust, and breathed the dust into his costumes, or something, I mean, something, something, something how the creation started, and when Adam was created, he reached inside of the port on the rib. And since the um, rib part part of the rib was came from man, that's where the came woman became involved. Right. Know. So I kinda like all uh, the Bible. I don't know anything about it. stardust. You're right. Well creationism is a biblical story. That's what that is. So that's why those would be on opposite side of the spectrum. Yeah. Right? Creationism, Big Bang Theory. Similar, getting us to the same place from very different lenses and perspectives, right? I would argue they're both 
different ways of framing the same story. But in, in my um, science classes, um, some of the instructors, like in astrology and whatnot, they won't let, they won't let you talk about God. Right, there's state laws and different things that prohibit us from talking about specific things in school. Okay. Right, I on the other hand am a communication studies mm -hmm. major, uh, so for me I'm concerned with words and the way that we frame things and construct reality. Okay. Right, or interpret reality. So to me, that's why I said they're both different ways of telling us the same story. Right, which is also an argument that you can make. That they're both true. Right, they're both different ways of us framing the same story. In which case, the affirmative can't win the round, nor can the neck. But it's the affirmative, the affirmative that has the burden of proof. Right? So if it's a wash, what you need to articulate to your judge is, hey judge, I recognize it's really hard to come down one way or the other on this particular topic. Because of that, the negative should get the round. And the most common type of resolution is policy. Right, which is asking for specific plan action, specific policy action. Where, for example, the United States federal government should substantially decrease the role of Southern Command in, the United, in Latin America. Could you repeat that again? The United States federal government should substantially decrease the role of the United States Southern Command in Latin America. That's the LD topic for this year. Militarization, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Reduce the role of the United States Southern Command in Latin America. Okay. Right? So the key word there is should. Yes. It's saying USFG, right, some actor, somebody should do this. And the plan, the policy that you come up with, is what that should do looks like. Right? They're asking me what should we do. I'm saying we should do this. Here's my plan or policy. The reason that's important on the negative is because it tells you, one, what type of arguments to construct. Two, what type to expect. And three, it sets expectations for the affirmative. Right, so if you have a straight up fact or value resolution, but you walk into the debate round and they run a policy, depending on your judge, that's when you run a position called a trichotomy. Trichotomy? Trichotomy. Like dichotomy, but with a tri. Right? Now, I say it depends on your judge, and it really depends on your judge. Because some judges are going to say, neither one of these are legitimate forms of debate, or that they don't allow us to adequately talk about whatever issues are happening in the real world. Right? So those judges will say, I don't care if they're interpreting these resolutions as something that we test through a policy, which is usually how it's justified. Right? Somebody will get up, they'll say, one second. They'll say uh, it's a factor of value resolution. However, we don't believe that we can have a substantial debate within that paradigm. Therefore, we are going to represent this factor of value, represent the resolution through this specific policy. Question? Uh, yeah, so pretty much like fact and value, do you want to stay away from those or do you want to? No. Oh, okay. No, no you don't have to. This is just something that other teams will do. Oh, okay, okay. So if you're familiar with your judge, a lot of times you'll be able to find a judge paradigm, right? And if they don't say, like, I, it has to be a policy round, right? Or if they say, I recognize three different forms of debate, then you want to run a position called a check on. Okay. Right? Which is a pretty basic position arguing that there are three different forms of debate and that they are ignoring the other two forms by taking either a fact or value resolution and framing it as a policy round. Okay, but uh, I don't mean this in a flippant manner, but isn't that kind of shitty as a judge? Like, if it's supposed to be a policy debate, but they're willing to listen to anything, like, if I'm affirmative, I'm like, uh, I, I'm going to be arguing this, but I'm going to switch to the policy, like, that seems like a really, like, dirty move. Like, if you're, oh, my judge will be cool with that, like, that seems really against the, 
idea of why we're, we're debating the topic and there's going to be policy, policy, fact, fact? Uh, I would say that that's just how some judges feel about it. I feel similarly. I don't think that it's the way it should be done, but it's just the truth of the event. Right? Some judges are just going to come in with that predisposition that a policy round is what they want to see because they feel like this ends up turning into nothing more than a mess. Right? Um, in terms of the other team doing it, the reason I as a judge don't care is because to me it's your job as a negative to then come back to that and prove to me on the flow, right, within the debate, why what they did was wrong. And then you have that discussion. Right. I don't insert myself into the round and say, oh, they ran a policy, this was a fact resolution, therefore they lose. In the same way, I don't do it the other way around. I know you haven't described the type of the dichotomy yet, but it sounds like would I just then stick to my guns about this not being in the sport and like just attacking the fact that they're not debating the thing that you should be debating, or do I have to keep kicking everything that they're saying too? I would not kick everything else they're saying. Because if the judge isn't being receptive to the trichotomy argument, and that's the only thing you have, then you're for sure going to lose the round. Can you point that out? Like, I, I don't point out. I'll talk about it later. Okay. No, you can go ahead. I just I don't know. Like it seems like. <clears throat> so the first uh, lecture we went to talk about everything having rules and structure and everything's the same. But if the judges are impartial and make kind of the rules of as they go along, or that they want to do this a certain way because they don't do with that, that seems kind of like. Well, you can teach me the right way to do everything, but if I get a judge who's like, eh, you can do whatever you want, then that seems kind of counterintuitive to me, and like, why am I here? Okay. That makes sense? I can understand that. Just like any other, in terms of like, just real world application, right? Yeah. My first lecture, I started off with two people. Then another person walked in the room. Then another person walked into the room. By the end of the lecture, I have eight people. Right? If I were, if I were hardline, these are the rules. As soon as the next person opened the door, I'd say, I'm sorry, my lecture started at 9.15, get out. Don't interrupt me, don't step in, this is my zone, this is how it's set up. Okay. Right? Flexibility, although it does create some dissonance, right? it creates this space where things can happen that we don't expect, it also allows for us to adapt and become creative. Okay. Right? So I get what you're saying, and I understand it. One, not all judges are like that. Two, there's no hard line rule that you have to have three, these three different forms of debate. Okay. Right? It's a theory. And part of that theory to defend that there should be the three different forms of debate is a trichotomy argument. Okay. But I just know, as a competitor and as a judge, that there are certain judges that aren't going to be receptive to that argument. So I don't want to lie to you and say, yo, if this happens, run trichot, you'll be good, because that's not going to work for every judge. Gotcha. Cool? Yeah, thank you. And I guess on, on that note, I, I know we're going to move on, but um, is, is it meaningful to anticipate what you describe as a judge paradigm? Absolutely. If we compete more, I'm sure we'll get to know judges and say, oh, this guy likes things framed as a policy. So Absolutely. Uh, there's a wiki where there's like a bunch of the judge philosophies up. I can't remember what the website is right now, but if you ask your coach, they'll probably be able to get it for you. Mm -hmm. You know what it is? Uh, the NF, there's one on NFA paperless debate. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe yeah. um, a lot of judges when when you you sign up for the tournament they'll have the judging philosophies there that your judge will help that your coach will help you out with. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So there's a way to gain access to how judges' philosophies are characterized. Yes. Yeah, and if you can't find the judging philosophy, ask a question. Yeah, cool. You can ask before the round. You can ask other competitors. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to, to get a feel for it. Right. I'm going to come here and I'll come back to you. Yeah. Okay, uh, can you just uh, say the definition of trichotomy one more time so I can get it? A trichotomy is a theoretical slash procedural position which argues that there are three distinct types of resolutions that exist in parliamentary debate. Policy, fact, and value. Okay. Mm -hmm. So three, you, three distinct positions that are in parliamentary debate. Yeah. Right? Okay. Thanks, man. So, I'm still at writing, so that's why I'm asking a question. So, like, the, uh, you can pretty much prepare one trichotomy argument and just carry with you wherever you go if you're going to run it? Right. Okay. That's yeah, and I'm that's saying. why this is the first thing that I'm saying. Okay. Right? Because in parliamentary debate, the resolution is the only thing you have, and you get it 15 to 20 minutes before the debate round starts. Right? Yeah. So, if you have a position already set up where 
you can run it, you give yourself some protection just based off the resolution itself, right? That's the only thing that it's resonating from, then that gives you a leg up. Yeah. And being in the narrative, uh, it's just to me, this is how it's seen is that if, 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 you, if, if the uh, affirmative doesn't have any uh, resolution or the negative kind of resolution on the factual side or the value side, then it does resort to the policy. It should. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing. Mean, if you can't come to any type of understanding, I mean, the amp and the detailing on the facts and the value, as far as coming to a resolution to prove the point, then we go back. Is this just like the um, sort of like the extra point when you go to the policy, should, and then the, the negative, it would have the advantage. Is that what you're telling me? I don't think the negative has the advantage when that happens. You have to prove your point, right? To, I mean, yeah. To, to get, I mean, right. So the way the way that it typically is said in a debate round is that we are going to prove either the fact or the value right. through the example of the policy. Okay. Right. So it's a way to win a lot of it. Cool? Mm -hmm. Cool? OK. So this is the type of resolution. Right? The next springboard that we as the negative have is the resolution itself. So the words of the resolution. Every word has meaning. So every word of the resolution, particularly the ones that can be interpreted in multiple ways, should be the first thing that you're looking up when you get back to your room, to your prep room. Right? Words like substantial, words like reasonable, Terms of art, like Latin America, for example. Because if they're talking about something that doesn't fit inside of that resolution, then you have grounds for a topicality argument. And the topicality argument says the policy or the way that you framed your affirmative does not fit underneath the resolution. Doesn't fit underneath that umbrella. We're talking about something that isn't relevant to the overarching discussion we should be having. Cool? So the top um, the topic the topicality mm -hmm. argument is just basically saying stating what your uh, your policy doesn't fall under that umbrella. Right. Of the Based off of a specific definition. Based off of specific Right. So if it is USFG should end the war on drugs, right? End? And war on drugs. Why end? Because it means different things for people. Yes? What else? In the what? In the financial spending? In, the In terms of this, why would that be an important word? If it means legislatively or through some other sort of action. Okay. Oh, there it is. It can also be a complete stop. You can't have anything else to do with the long rest. That's cool. It pigeonholes. Mm -hmm. Right? So if they're like, therefore we will legalize marijuana. All right, cool. So what about cocaine, heroin, methamphetamines, ecstasy, every other drug? What about those? No, we're not touching those. Well, it sounds to me like you're not ending. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good choosing. Right. So going into the round, you have to have a definition of end, which says exactly that. It's full stop. To completely sever. To no longer act in according to. And, and the flip side of that, if you end something, then that means it's over. Right. right. That means there's no more war on any drugs. And, right. And you can't. Which is the next thing, right? What is the war on drugs? What does that mean? 
Does that mean we're no longer able to enforce any drug policies? Or is that the legislation that came specifically out of this era? That's kind of wrong. Is that what you referred to earlier as a term of art? Yes. Right. These words collectively are referring to something. Individually, they're very different things. And this is for every round. Right? And the reason why it's so important to really hone in on this pigeonhole is because it gives you tons of ground, for one. Right? It gives you a really clear idea of what it is that they have to run. And secondly, it gives you amazing counter plan strategy. Because you get to say, you know what? Marijuana, cool. Coca leaf in certain, certain forms, cool, no big deal. But there's no way in hell we are going to legalize heroin or crack cocaine. And then have specific disadvantages to those two drugs, counter plan all drugs except for XYZ. But Rob Ford was cool. So. <coughs> Uh, uh, the, the Canadian uh, like mayor who smoked crack. Oh. I, I don't know anything about crack. Okay, yeah. No. <laughs> so, so, he's a cool guy. It's pretty tough. <laughs> All right, it's pretty crack. American. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And that's for anything. Right? No matter what the resolution is, if it's big picture, you're forced to do something big picture, and you can take out a piece of that picture and say, except for this part, that's devastating. Mm -hmm. It's devastating to their case. Because now you get to argue, you're right. You're totally right. War on drugs is bad, targets people of color, targets people of lower socioeconomic class, wastes money in prisons, then all these different things. You're absolutely right. Marijuana shouldn't be a big deal. This drug, that drug shouldn't be, big, shouldn't be that big of a deal. But heroin is killing people. And they would have to somehow find a way to defend heroin. Yeah, they have to find them. And like just basically force the app to be in an awkward position. Right. What they're defending and how broad the company exactly. would be. And think of the time suck that happens. Yeah. yeah. Right? They spend seven minutes constructing their case, and you get to go, okay, cool. Flow the entire case across. We agree. But this. And that's potent enough. Mm -hmm. So here's a disadvantage. Disadvantage heroin. Exploding of heroin usage, more kids on the street, increased homelessness, increased poverty, right? All these different terrible things happen. Counter plan, legalize all drugs except for heroin. They can't happen at the same time. Right? It's mutually exclusive, you can't do both. And they don't get to argue Oh, uh, no, well, heroin specifically is going to cause all these other problems, right, that they're highlighting in their harm scenario. I mean, they can, but that's not a strong argument, right? Because their own plan bites into it. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most effective types of counter plans. Yeah. But this matters on how they define the word end, right? Right. Which is why you have to have topicality. Right? You want to make sure that you're pushing them into that hole that the resolution is leading them towards. It's all about strategy. And any time there's a, there's a large blanket type of resolution or plan that your opponent is putting forward, that should be what you're thinking. Is where's the little something that I can pull out of that? If unless you have clear disadvantages. If you have clear disadvantages, fine, go for that. Right? But if it's something like GMOs, right? We talk about GMOs being bad all the time. Cool. But they're also extremely easy to reproduce. So if we're using GMOs for a specific to feed a specific group in Africa or something like that, and they're like ban all GMOs, then how does this group continue to get their food? There you go. Right. Ban so, GMO production would be exceptional. <coughs> Boom. Cool. Right. 
right? U.S. involvement in Latin America. Say, uh, I don't know, something in Guatemala, right? U.S. troops are doing terrible everywhere else. For some reason, they're doing really good in Guatemala. But they say, pull everybody out. Or cut funding everywhere. Cut funding except for Guatemala. Get it? So in terms of resolutional analysis, right, when you're the neg, that's how you need to be thinking. So what is the res telling us? How can we use this as a springboard to start generating arguments before we know what our opponent is running? And you should split up too, right? First thing, if someone needs need topic info, all right, I'm going to get the topic info. You start looking up definitions on this word and this word, whatever the keywords are for that round. The other type of resolution, which can be any one of these, metaphor. The tricky thing about metaphor resolutions is that there's symbolic expressions or statements that can be interpreted in a limitless number of ways. The only thing that you can really do on the neg in a metaphor round is to talk about the sort of core of whatever it is the metaphor is doing. Right? So if it's overcoming something or standing out or something of that nature, they have to be able to demonstrate how whatever it is they're choosing to do is holding true to the core of that metaphor. Do you get what I mean? So if the metaphor is, it's raining cats and dogs, right? That shows an abundance of something of an unnatural to supernatural rate. So, say for example, they choose to parametricize that down to, I don't know, rise of the housing market or something like that. Right? If you argue, well, it's not, right? It just isn't for whatever reason, and then you have arguments saying that it isn't, then they're not falling, in, they're not falling into the scope of the metaphor, right? That's a really bad example, though. That really room. Trying to think. So is metaphor like a, a type of argument? And It'll be the resolution. The resolution itself will be a metaphor. Okay. Like when I went to state, one of the metaphors was uh, we're dancing in the streets. We're dancing in the streets? Yes. Okay. Now, on the affirmative, I loved it. Right? Like I ran Don't Ask, Don't Tell like six times. Is that a state nationals? Is that a don't ask, don't tell? No. Oh, wait, okay. Right. No, don't ask, don't tell isn't a metaphor, but there would be metaphors that I would then interpret and then to justify running don't ask, don't tell. Oh, right. okay, you say you'd apply your metaphor to your argument. Right? Right. Okay. okay. So, for, for example, if it's 30 guys in a bar and two girls and one of the girls tell the other girl, hey, it's raining man in here. Mm -hmm. Would that be a perfect example of one of those metaphors or examples? Yeah, a metaphor resolution could be any type of metaphorical statement. Like literally anything. It's not it's not that common. Right? It isn't. But when it happens on the neg, it just takes the road right from under you. So your argument is based on trying to What is the something that's happening in the metaphor? Right? We're dancing in the streets. I argued equals openness, excitement, celebration. Gotcha. Right? Don't ask, don't tell is we're not going to ask you if you are a member of the LGBTQ community, and we don't want you to tell us. So I argued as a representation of dancing in the streets, the military will remove the don't ask, don't tell policy and allow for members of the LGBTQ community to openly serve in the military. I got it. Okay. Right. What does the Q stand for? Queer. Queer. 
Is that something they did to add? If, if, if I'm wrong, if it's a different key, you can tell me. I think it's ambiguous. Is it? Yeah. So what? Did yeah, they just add it on the weather? It was just yeah. LVG. It's not, it's not it's exclusively so it's clear. It's expensive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, no, but uh, so the point is, for the night, it would be to, to advance like the core of the metaphor. So you were saying as AF, like that was great for you. That's right. really cool. Right. But say I didn't justify it though. Yeah. Right? Like say I didn't have that justification up front. Uh -huh. Right, then how is the day or the judge supposed to understand that I'm being called? Uh, yeah. yeah. Right? And Which is why I'm bringing it up. Like, as the negative, same thing, right? Like, the resolution is, is your map, right? It's the only thing that you have to stand on mm -hmm. during your prep time. Yeah. So if you have a metaphor around, that's the something you need to be contemplating. Mm -hmm. Right? Is what exists in this metaphor that I can hold them to mm -hmm. as a means of accountability? <coughs> So can I say something like along the lines of like we're dancing in the street means everybody should go out outside naked and like literally dancing and then that and then the dancing will lead to like losing fat and then losing fat means uh, everybody should, should be playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> so, sure. Yeah. And then, you can make that interpretation. That will work. Uh, I mean, anything that you use is going to be argued against, yeah. right? But yeah, you can run that out and try to justify. Um, in, in that context, what were some of the more effective negative arguments that you faced when you were running with that? Against my justification? Yeah. Yeah. No. Dang. <laughs> I mean, I was, my undergrad's in literature, right? Um, like, and I write poetry and stuff. So in terms of interpreting words and ideas um, and thoughts, I'm um, pretty good at that. Okay, sweet. Right, so, yeah. The argument that typically came out was something of, like, it was a technicality about uh, removing the uniform code, uh -huh. and that removing don't ask, don't tell would actually revert military practices to where uh -huh. they were before, uh -huh. which was so that they just straight out weren't allowed to be in the military whatsoever. Oh, like a slippery slope. Right. Yeah, but my argument, like in the plan, that that wasn't the that wasn't the crux of our plan. Right. Like our plan made it very clear what it is that what it was that we were doing. So it's advantageous for half these uh, metaphorical resolutions because they get to frame, they have more freedom in framing things. Right. They're not as susceptible to being pigeonholed as in the previous example. Right. Okay. Okay. Now there are times where the resolution is going to be a policy and it's going to be very specific. Like it'll be HR 115-1196 or something like that. Right? In that instance, same thing, right? What's the bill? So we know what bill that it is they actually have to defend. What's wrong with it? Right? Those are two basic questions that you should have for every negro. What is the something? What's wrong with it? What do they have to defend? What can we pull out of that? And that would be for counterplan ground. Counterplans should be a few things. It should be mutually exclusive. Arguably, it should be non-topical. I say arguably because not everybody agrees with that. I believe it should solve your opponent's case. Megan, why is it strategic for it to solve your opponent's case? Because you solving the case means that you are outweighing them, so there's no need for them to do the plan, which just makes you better, which means you are more preferable. And since you lose presumption in the status quo, you need to win that your case solves. So if they're saying, if they have really a really like just gnarly harm scenario, right? Like there's kids being being shipped off in boxes. If you don't solve that case, but you're running some counter plan dealing with something different, they're gonna be like, judge, we're talking about kids being put in boxes. 
We are the only ones that deal with that in this debate round. Vote affirmative. But if you say, no, we're solving that case, your case makes it even worse, and here's an additional advantage that's coming along with our counter plan. They don't get to make that argument. Right? Their harms is the something that's perpetuating all of the motion of the case. It's why we should care. Okay. Why non-topical? That is a theory. Yeah. Right? Part of the reason why it's part of the understanding as to why it should be non-topical is because that's after. Right? Affirmative ground is topicality. But I don't necessarily believe with it being non-topical because the way that the affirmative justifies their resolutionality right. is that the plan is a specific instance of the topic. Mm -hmm. That they're parametricizing down to that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, at that point, for me, as a judge, anything other than plan is fair ground for the neck. Right. right? But not everybody agrees. Okay. <clears throat> hey, um, I'm interested in you yeah, have point number one, the, plan, the counter plan being mutual exclusion. Yeah. But so solving the same problem, or rather addressing the same harm. Right. So remember when we were talking about drugs, uh -huh. right, the drug policy. Mm -hmm. And I said, everything except for heroin. Mm -hmm. how, can you, <coughs> how can you do both? How can you do both? How can you legalize all drugs and legalize all drugs except for heroin? Okay. Yeah, that's true. So that would be mutual exclusion. Right. But the, kid, the harm being solved is damage to society by certain drugs, and we would say, okay, we're still solving exactly what you're interested in. Right. And the reason it has to be mutually exclusive is because if it's not, what's the benefit? Why do counterpoint? Why not just do both? Which is an argument that will come from the affirmative called permutation. Right, you run an awesome counter plan, they're like, okay, cool, do both. Uh -huh. And then they make arguments as to why they're not mutually exclusive. Why both of them can exist in the same world. And that's both type. Let's see what oh, those are the only three. Right? So with any counter plan. You also want to have a DA. Right? You want to have a disadvantage. You don't want to have the counter plan by itself because then you're, you're not saying that their plan is doing anything bad. Right? So the disadvantage is important to point out why we shouldn't do plan action and to articulate what negative effects plan action is going to have. The only time I would say it's okay not to have a disadvantage is if you have a gnarly case turn. Right? So if you go onto their case, you go onto their advantage or their harm scenario or their solvency, typically solvency, and you put a huge turn arguing that their plan action is not only not going to solve, but it's going to supercharge all of their harm scenario and make it worse. I don't think you need a disadvantage after that. What is supercharging? Supercharge, yeah, it's just my word, right? It really just means that your, their harm scenario, we recognize it's bad. After your plan, it's going to be way worse. Because your plan is going to cause it to get worse by doing X, Y, Z. OK, so you're gonna, it's like basically you're going to amplify your already bad. Yeah. OK. Right, one could argue that's what the drug on war has turned into in the first place. Right, it was initial group of legislation that was put out to help deal with uh, youth on drugs, prison populations, poverty, and one can argue that it made everything worse. Okay, cool. Gotcha. Right? So if you're doing that, that's a huge offensive argument that you don't need to have a full-fledged position for. You know what I mean? So at that point, it just becomes strategy in terms of time. Like, if you know you have solid arguments on their solvency, just turning their solvency and blowing it up into a huge disadvantage without having to run a full-blown disadvantage, then why waste that time when you get to your counter plan? Because that allows you to focus on your counter plan, flush it out, and tack on an additional advantage. Right? So remember, like in a policy round, it's not benefits. 
So you're always trying to weigh good things happening from plan, bad things happening from plan. So if, you're, if, you, if these are the good things, and these are the bad things, and you're going, oh, you're actually making all of your harms way worse, boom. Oh, I have a counter plan that can solve way better and solves all of your harms, boom. Oh, and by the way, here's an additional thing my counter plan does, which is awesome, but doesn't deal directly with your harms, boom. Do you know what I mean? As much as you can weigh them down with negative impacts and lift yourself up, either by solving things they're not solving for, or a counter plan, right, which says they don't solve their harms, but you can, the more likely you are to win the round. All right, guys, that is our session for today. If you have any other questions, you see me walk around, please ask. Lunch is starting right now. Uh,